together. We hope that you're staying strong. I've been so encouraged to hear from so many of you in different ways, whether we hear from you through the Facebook or we hear from you through text message or phone calls. We're just appreciative of all of those things. It's very encouraging for Brandon and Pay and myself to, to receive your encouragement as we try to offer you this opportunity and really to come together together. Remember, worship is so very important in our lives and our praise and spiritual fervor towards God. And so let's continue to be fervent in the spirit, to continue to serve God, continue to do as he has asked us, even in troublesome times. If you have the opportunity now while you're watching this on Facebook Live, go ahead and like or comment or share. Let us know that you are here uh, so that we can join in together. Pate has picked out another four songs for us to sing that are really closely directed to the lesson this morning. And uh, we've also got Brandon who will offer a prayer for us and we will take the Lord's Supper once again this morning for our worship service. I trust that you've all uh, shared this and, and done those things below, and we're appreciative of that. So now that you're back and, uh, and together, hopefully in your living rooms there with your Lord's Supper uh, elements, the bread and the cup, and uh, with all of your Bibles ready to turn open and your voices ready to sing praise to God, we will go ahead and start our worship service. So I will turn it over to Pate so that he can lead us first in our song. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you this morning. If you will, turn in your psalm books, if you have them at home, to number 71. To number 71, as the deer. 7-1, we'll be singing all verses. After this song, we'll have our opening prayer this morning. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. Silver only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. Spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. This time we're having opening prayer this morning. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for the many blessings that we have, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day, Lord, and Lord, we thank you for the rain that we had uh, this morning, Lord, and as springtime comes upon us, it just makes your world so beautiful and, and flowers start to bloom, and Lord, we just uh, let us look at those things and, and realize how, how miraculous they are, Lord, and let us never take our blessings for granted. Lord, just uh, be with us as 
uh, be with us as we go throughout our week, Lord, and, and just uh, guide us and guard us and, and just direct us in the way that you would have us to go, Lord. Lord, watch over the, those that are sick and shut in, Lord, and Lord, if it be your will, just, uh, just uh, bring their wanted health back to them, Lord. Lord, just be with the men and women that serve this country uh, overseas, Lord, and Lord, just watch over them, and if it be your will, just bring them back to their loved ones. Lord, uh, at this time, be with the, the nurses and the doctors that, uh, that are fighting this virus, Lord, and, and uh, helping to, to uh, pull those that are sick through. Lord, just be with them and guide them and give them the wisdom and the knowledge to, uh, to just give, give them the best possible care. Lord, just uh, be with missionaries across this world that, that do your works, Lord, and uh, on foreign souls and, and, and here in this great nation, Lord, and just be with them and, and may many great things come from the, the works that they do. Lord, just uh, be with our country, Lord, as we go through these things and it's just uh, uncharted territory, Lord, and just be with us, be with the leaders of our nation and Lord, just give them wisdom and guidance and and Lord, uh, at the end of the day, Lord, just uh, just may this this world just become a godly nation again, or this nation become a godly nation again. Lord, just uh, be with the elders of this church, Lord, and Lord, just give them the 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 guidance and the wisdom to to guide us in the way that you would have us to go, Lord. Lord, just uh, be with Todd as he presents us a lesson. Uh, here in a moment, Lord, and just be with him and, and guide him and, and and just direct him and may, he th may we be able to take things from that lesson to apply it in our lives, Lord, and to take it out into the world and to to bring others to where they may know you, Lord. Lord, it's all these things that we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second song this morning will be number 96. 96. I stand in awe. Number 96. You are beautiful beyond description. To marvelous for words. To wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description. Majesty enthroned above, and I stand, I stand in all of you. I stand, I stand in all of you. Only God to whom all praise is due. I stand in all of you. You are beautiful beyond description. To marvelous for words. To wonderful for comprehension. Like nothing ever seen or heard. Can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description, majesty enthroned above, and I stand, I stand in all. I stand, I stand in all of you. Only God to whom all praise is due. I stand in all of you. 
Psalm before our Lord's Supper this morning will be number 313. 313. 313. We'll be singing the first and last verses. The old rugged cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross I will ever be true in shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away, where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the old rugged Till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a We have come to our time during our worship service in which we commemorate, we remember the Lord's death. I want to read to you as we remember his body, the bread which we take, we remember the blood he poured out, which is represented in the fruit of the vine, the cup upon which we partake. I want to read with you 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 through 29. And Paul's encouragement and command for how we should treat these emblems and the way in which we take them. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. As we offer these prayers for the bread and for the cup, as we partake of this Lord's Supper, let us examine ourselves and our faith, our spirituality toward God, and make sure that we are in the right place, that our heart is focused on the right thing. And that at this time especially, we have nothing in our minds but remembering the death, the great sacrifice that our Lord gave to us, where he gave his life so that we can have life. Will you pray for me for the bread? Father God, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that your son has given us. As we take this bread, Father, may we remember 
vividly with great imagery the sacrifice that your son gave us. May we be convicted, examining ourselves, and taking it in a worthy manner, pleasing to you and, uh, and helping in our pursuit to be more like you. May we remember now this bread, the body of your son, Jesus Christ, who hung upon that cross. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You know, Jesus dying on the cross was no easy task, but he did it willingly, and he did it for you and me. And now we have opportunity, and so often I believe we rush this opportunity. We try to get through it as fast as we can. Maybe it's for fear that we think our mind is going to go on to something else, or maybe it's just because it's been habit to just rush through this process of taking the bread and the cup. But I want us to slow down this morning. Having taken the bread and remembering and understanding it to represent the body of Jesus who hung upon that cross, now we come to the point where we remember the blood, the blood that was not spilt. Spilling implies an accident. But the Lord purposely poured out his blood for you and for me so that we can have life and life everlasting. But in order to have that life, we must be presented before God and all purity, and holiness, and righteousness. And and Jesus has provided for us His cleansing blood so that we can be presented in a pure and holy way. But we must live righteously in order to go before God's throne. And so as we take this cup, let us slow down our minds and our thoughts, and for just a moment, remember intentionally the death that Jesus went through as He hung suspended between heaven and earth upon that cross and his blood poured out this blood which we take the cup of this fruit of the vine representing it will you pray with me now father god once again we humbly bow before your throne and god we're so thankful yet sorrowful over the death of jesus god we're thankful because we know that through his blood we have the ability to be cleansed of all of our sin But we're sorrowful because it's our sin that caused him to have to pour that blood out. God, we just pray that we never take these things for granted, but instead we slow down and are intentional about examining ourselves and our faith towards you, about remembering the sacrifice that Jesus gave, about thinking upon it intentionally so that we will never forget, but always remember the great sacrifice that Jesus willingly gave on our behalf. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. While the taking of the bread and the cup has been completed for this portion of our worship, remembering the Lord's death continues on, not only at this moment, but every day of our lives. And more so, as we talked last week, we continue to remember the resurrection through which we have victory and life everlasting. It is amazing what Jesus has done, the firstborn from the dead. He never died again, but he conquered death so that we don't have to face it. We face death in the physical sense, but we do not have to face it in the spiritual sense. And because of that, we have great blessings from God, salvation from Him. And it's that mercy and salvation and grace that He has given us that should drive us and our motivation to serving Him fervently, always with a burning passion and desire after God. 
And part of serving Him is the part in which we take in this, this section of our worship service where the elders have designated a time to give back as we have been given. And God has blessed us, especially people in America, and people worldwide, but especially us with so many riches in so many ways. And so we need to use those riches to our advantage. You know, when I say that, it doesn't mean that God favors us over anyone else. It just means that we have the opportunity now through the blessings we have and the material things that we have to give back to the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God will continue to grow and bless the lives of so many. So the elders have instructed each of you as members of Mount Zion Church of Christ to give back in a certain way during this time of quarantine uh, and exile, if you, if you will. And so during this time, as you give back in the way that the elders have instructed, I hope that your hearts and minds are doing it joyfully and that you're thinking intentionally, planning it out from week to week as Paul has instructed. I'm going to offer a prayer now for that contribution. Many of you may have already given or are getting ready to, or however that, that works out for you. But I want to pray over that, over the elders, as they determine how those monies will be used in the advancement of the kingdom. Will you pray with me? Father God, we are so blessed by you. We are blessed not only in physical and material things, but we are blessed by you even more so in spiritual ways. And God, we pray that we will never take for granted those ways, for we know that those are the greatest blessings because you've given them to us. God, we pray that as we come to the time normally in our worship service for giving back to you, that you will guide our hearts and minds, that we will do so each week purposefully, intentionally, planning it out, God, to give back to you in the way that you have, have taught us to do and, and, and command us to do. And God, as we give, let us do so with willing hearts. And we pray if our hearts are not willing, that you will transform them, that you will transform them in the only way that you know how so that we can become willing participants of the contribution to your kingdom. We pray for the elders as they use those funds to advance your kingdom. When we pray for your kingdom, that you will use us as vessels and, and give us more and more opportunity each day to serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Scripture. If you will turn in your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 16. Once again, that's Philippians chapter 3, verses 8 through 16. Yet indeed, I also count all the things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own right, own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Therefore, let us as many as are mature have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I just pretended like I heard you and woke you all up, and I'm so glad that you've joined us on Facebook Live. Maybe you're watching back on YouTube or even listening on our podcast. Thank you so much for being with us this morning during our worship service. I hope you've enjoyed uh, so far the, the worship that we have done through this avenue. I know it's not the same, but isn't it amazing that God has at least blessed us with these technologies so that we can worship together even in this way? I long and hope and pray as I trust you are doing the same for the day, hopefully soon, especially here in Alabama, uh, where we can gather back together 
uh, physically and, and hear each other's voices and see each other's faces and hear the great singing. Of course, I say once again, we're so blessed to have Pate with us. Uh, he is a wonderful song leader, and I'm thankful for his willingness to show up each Sunday morning and to uh, be with us as we sing together. I hope that you were singing at home in your living rooms and uh, with your families, wherever you might be at, and enjoying the worship as we praise and honor and glorify God. If you have your Bibles with you, turn open to Psalm chapter 63. Psalm chapter 63, and that's where we're going to be this morning. The title for our lesson is Earnest Thirst, and it comes from this psalm. This psalm is a psalm that David prays while once again he's on the run, specifically this time in the wilderness of Judah. Most likely he's running from his son Absalom and we've already studied a psalm where he was in the same exact situation running from his son, uh, his son. So it is possible that these psalms, Psalm 63 and Psalm chapter 3, are written at similar time periods in David's life. Now what's interesting is that Psalm 63 is a psalm or a prayer of praise and admiration where David is longing and desiring after God. Psalm chapter 3 is more of a prayer to petition God. He asks God for certain things. What's fascinating about Psalm 63 is that David never makes a petition in this psalm. He makes a petition in Psalm 3 but not here. Instead, he expresses his longing for God's presence and praise and joy and fellowship and confidence and salvation without asking for a single blessing. And that is so profound to help us in our lives today to turn, upon, uh, to, turn to God and trust and fully relying upon him. Some scholars say that this psalm, chapter 63, was used by the ancient churches whenever they would gather together on Sunday mornings, they would sing together some of the psalms, and this one was considered the morning hymn or the morning song, where they would sing this one first to kick off their services because of the great language of praise upon uh, praise to God and desire after Him. John Chrysostom, who is an ancient church father, writes that this psalm here is the spirit and soul of the whole book of psalms. It might be one of your favorites. It might be one that many people are very familiar with. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful psalm, and it has beautiful language to help us to understand what it means to deeply desire after God. David in his life when he's writing this is facing so many pressures and we too face many pressures in our life. We are facing an immense pressure right now at this moment with this quarantine and the virus that is going on and this prayer here teaches us to earnestly seek after and thirst for God. You see, it teaches us that when the pressures of life surround us in defeat, people of God earnestly seek and thirst after Him instead of relying upon the things of this world. Now David teaches us many, many things in this psalm, but I want to focus on three points this morning. And they're broken down into the sections, verses 1 through 4, then verses 5 through 8, and verses 9 through 11. I like the one scholar who said that verses 1 through 4 is David talking about God being his, uh, God being his, his desire. In verses 5 through 8, he says God is his delight. In verses 9 through 11, David says God is his defense. He is his desire and his delight and his defense. And that's exactly what we see this morning. Let us read the psalm and then we'll make point of the three different things I want us to review. The three points that David teaches us on how to rely fully upon God. It says, O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your glory and power. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. 
when I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult. For the mouths of liars will be stopped. In verses 1 through 4, David displays an intense conviction for God. He shows his longing desire after God that despite the pressures that David faces, his sole priority is to seek the Lord. This is the same desire that we must have. This is the same priority that we must have. That despite any of the pressures that we face in life, no matter whether it's tribulations or troubles or transgressions or iniquity, no matter what trouble we face in life, our priority is to always seek the Lord. David has fled from his throne. He's left behind his housing, his kingdom, his wives. His own, his, his own son, Absalom, who he loves, is after him trying to end his life and remove him from the throne. And yet, in all of this, David wasn't seeking for any of those types of things. Instead, he was seeking for the Lord. You notice, he wasn't praying, God, give me my wives back. God, give me my kingdom back. God, God, stop my son and make him love me. He didn't pray for any of these things. Rather, he prayed, I shall seek after you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. Your love is better than life. I will bless you. David's entire focus, his entire prayer is not a petition for removal. It's a petition for more from God. And so his entire, all of his words in this prayer are pointed toward God. He longs after God. He wants more of God. He desires for God. And this is the same desire that we must have. It's an amazing statement. You see, because we try to fill our lives and our emptiness so often with so many things of this world... But those things, while they might be good things, they're not always God things. And we need to make sure that the emptiness in our life is always filled by God. And that's exactly what David's praying for. In verse 1, he says that he thirsts for God. You know, Jesus says similar words. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, he says, Those who thirst for righteousness will be blessed. In John chapter 7, verse 37, he says, Anyone who is thirsty, come after me. In John chapter 4, Jesus tells the Samaritan woman, Whoever drinks from the water that he gives will never be thirsty again. Isn't it amazing the words of David and Jesus matching up here? The thirst after the Lord. We sang a song earlier about how the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you, God. These words are taken straight from Scripture, Psalm chapter 42. And it teaches us in that psalm that in the midst of our troubles and struggles and trials in life, we still seek after the Lord, we still praise Him, we still desire to thirst for Him. In verse 2, he goes on and talks about how he desires for worship. Read this verse with me again. It's one of my favorite in the entire psalm. It says, I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Our desire for worship must be as deep as David's. You see, David is sitting in the wilderness and he's remembering back to the time when all of the people would gather in the sanctuary and behold the glory and power of the Lord as they worshipped him. Isn't that exactly what we are thinking about during these times? As you sit there this morning, as I look out to an empty auditorium of empty pews, I think and I believe you think about how we beheld the glory and the power of the Lord in the midst of the congregation, the assembly, the temple of God as we worship together in unity and spirit, as we sang together and prayed together, partook of the Lord's Supper together, as we studied the Word together, 
as we gave together, as we fellowship together, all of these things, we, we are longing for them back. And so we find ourselves in a similar situation as David where we deeply desire for the worship of God. And that's exactly what David is saying. He wants once again to see the power and glory of God. Uh, it doesn't, the Bible isn't explicit about when David saw those things, but we know that this word glory is the same word that was used in Exodus chapter 40 and 1 Kings chapter 8. Whenever the, the glory of God filled the tabernacle in Exodus, and it filled the temple that Solomon built in 1 Kings 8, where the glory of God fills that temple, and, it's, and the glory of God has always been and will always be His special presence with His people. And we see that today because we are the temple. We are the sanctuary. And so therefore we see the power and the glory of God together when we worship. See, to David, worship wasn't a habitual thing. It wasn't just a habit or routine. It wasn't something that he just did. There was no start time or end time. David worshipped because he desired to worship. He longed to worship. It wasn't boring to him. It wasn't monotonous. It wasn't just something to do. It wasn't even something he did because he was a follower of God. It was something he wanted to do because he loved God. And that should be our desire for worship too. It's not something we do because we're followers of Jesus, because we're baptized Christians. It's something that we want to do because of those things, because of what Jesus has done for us. Worship today shouldn't be boring. It should be something we long after, we desire for. It's not something that we have to do. It's something that we get to do. And that's such an important difference between those words and concepts. And we should worship the Father because we have a great desire to do it. I believe that this quarantine, this virus, if it teaches us anything, if there's any benefit from it at all, it will show us and teach us to never again take for granted the assembling of the worship of God's people. We have taken for granted these things too often, and too often they've become just a habit to us, just a routine. But instead, maybe now, we'll wake up, and when we worship together, when we sing and pray, when we, when we praise and fellowship, take of the communion, give back, preach, and listen to the preaching, when we do all of these things all together, wholeheartedly, we'll desire to do all of them at the same time, then we will see and behold the power and glory of God. And God will reveal Himself. Aren't you excited? Aren't you looking forward to that day? Even in our immense pressure right now, we can learn to not take for granted the worshiping of God. In verse 3, he beholds, or he longs rather, he longs for the love that is in God. It says, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. David has the attitude that life is not worth living without the love of God. And it is this love and desire that he has that drives him to serve God. It's the same love that we should have. You know, Paul has a similar attitude in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24 and Philippians chapter 1 and verses 21 through 23. In Philippians, Paul says, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Of course, we know that Paul is saying whatever he does in his life, his, the living that he does is only worth it if he is living for Christ, if he is teaching the message of the good news of Jesus. And that should be the same attitude that we have. And then Paul says, to die is gain. Well, why is this? Because if we die, we go on to be with Jesus. And so the attitude is that life is not worth living without the love of God. It's the same attitude that we must have as well. What's so fascinating is that love is one of the most precious of all values that we have. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. You know, the verse doesn't end there. Instead, it teaches us, but the greatest of these is love. That's what Paul tells the Corinthians, and Paul tells us today, love is the greatest virtue and characteristic that we can have and receive. And so isn't it strange how we seek for joy and happiness and satisfaction and so many other things in this world, 
but we rarely seek after the everlasting love that is found in God. You know, David longed for God and he longed for God's love, but he never had the opportunity, don't miss this, David never had the opportunity of beholding the great love of God at the cross of Christ. We have. And so how much more should we long to love God? Finally, in verse 4, he postures to praise. We've talked about posture an awful lot. It says, so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. The word bless here means to adore or praise or give blessing. It's a phrase of loyalty and it implies kneeling before a ruler. And that's exactly what David says that he will do. Because the love of God is better than life itself, David says he will give his life to God. Have you said the same thing? He then says, I will lift my names at the sound of your I will lift my hands at the sound of your name. I want you to imagine for a moment being at a sporting event or a concert. And when that big play is made or whenever that favorite crowd favorite song is played, what do all the people in the crowd do? They jump on their feet and raise their hands in joy and admiration. They're excited. They appreciate what is going on at that moment. David says that he will respond in that way to the name of the Lord. How often do we not treat the name of the Lord as sacred as David treats it here? You see, today in general, I believe our society rarely treats God's name with sacred praise. But we can change that. You and I can change that both for ourselves and we can start a movement to show that God's name is sacred and at His name we should bow in loyalty and praise before Him. We should show our appreciation and admiration and joy in Him. And so how do we change that? By one being an example and taking, not taking his name in vain, but instead understanding that at the name, at his name, we will, we will lift our hands and praise to him. And then we teach with bold love towards others why it is so important to have a posture in our hearts towards praise to God. David verses 5 through 8 shows that God's presence permeates every area of his life. You see, God isn't just a spoke in the wheel, He's the hub. God isn't just a slice of life who rounds out your pursuits, but rather God permeates every area of your life. He's at the center of every decision you make. He's the Lord of every relationship you have. There is no area in your life, whether it's your business, your family, your education, or whatever, where God is not to be an integral part There is no division between the sacred and the secular. All of our life is to be related to God. And that's what these verses show. God's presence permeates every inch, every ounce, every essence of David's life. In verse 5 he says his soul is satisfied by God. And the imagery he gives here is a contrast to verse 1 where he says that he thirsts after God. If being thirsty wasn't as good enough a metaphor, well this one is here where he says that his soul is feasted because he is so satisfied by God. This here begins to show that David's praise is now exuberant. It is increasing and it is great. In verse 6, you see that his thoughts are upon God. He says, I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of night. See, David's appetite for God was sharpened and strengthened in the wilderness. He was made strong because of the troubles that he went through. But it is now more strong uh, because of the wakefulness of the watches of night. You see, this is an expression here to the slow progress of the hours throughout the night. Have you ever stayed up through the night by yourself? Do you notice how much louder and slower the clock seems to tick? How time just slowly moves by? Maybe you've been restless before. David here is restless. His enemies are in hot pursuit. They are on his tail and they are wanting to kill 
kill him and remove him from his throne. And so David being restless here, he, he faces both the wilderness and the wakefulness of the watches of night. And it's during these times that he enlists his thoughts to think about and meditate on God, to think about the Lord. David, you see, is undoubtedly busy. It's safe to assume that he has many stresses and worries and weariness in his life. He could have easily brushed off God and saying, I don't have time right now, or I'm too tired right now, or I'm too weary or stressed to focus on you right now. I've got to focus on my situation. I've got to take care of these people. I've got to get back to the kingdom and rule on the throne. But instead, David doesn't do any of that. Because David makes it a priority to spend time alone with God. In our times of greatest despair or troubles or stressors or worries, do we make it a priority to spend time alone with God? It's been once said that there's three types of Christians in any gathering. There's the Christian who professes Jesus Christ, but their profession is false because their life doesn't look anything like Jesus. They live in the world, they're of the world, they're part of the world, and they say Jesus' name, but they don't follow him at all. Then there's the other Christian who follows at a distance. They're careful not to get too close because it would be too hard and they're careful not to get too far away or else they'll feel like they're lost. But instead, they have a hand that is dipped in the pot of the world and a hand that is dipped in the pot of life. And then there's that third Christian, the third Christian who is completely devoted. Whether sunshine or storm, their life cleaves for God. They are completely surrounded by God and embrace God with complete community union and conviction and dedication toward him. These people want God. They want him so intensely because they know that he and he alone will satisfy the deep longing and desire of their hearts. David was a person like this where he desired God above everything else and that's what led him in verse 8 to show that his or verse 7 rather to show that his help and his safety are in God. You see, David is filled by God, he thinks on God, and he's safe in the presence of God. He's not simply referring to physical safety, though. Of all people, David knows that physical safety is not guaranteed. Instead, he's talking about the safety of his soul, spiritual safety. This entire psalm is about his soul. Look at verse 1 and verse 5 and verse 8. It completely surrounds the spiritual safety and help of God. It's not about the physical. With this understanding, David once again makes a reference to where his joy comes from. In verse 5, he says his lips will sing praise of joy. In verse 7 here, he says that in the shadow of his wings, he will sing for joy. David recognizes that joy doesn't come from the world, but his joy comes from God. And today, our joy comes from God. But you know, joy is a strange word for David to use in his current predicament, isn't it? However, even though David's in this pressure, he uses this word. David, because David knows that no matter the pressures of life, he can always praise and sing joy to the Lord, having joy in his life because of the great provision of God. And we too can have joy despite the pressures of life because of the provision of God. And this allows us to say the words of David in verse 8 where he says that his soul clings to him. To cling in the Hebrew once again means to, to be loyal in relation to affection. And here this word cling is the same Hebrew word that's used in Genesis 2.24 to describe the marriage relationship, the marriage covenant. It's also the same word that Ruth uses in her determination to stay with Naomi in Ruth chapter 1 verse 14. Here it literally means to cling to with a hot pursuit. David follows after God like a soldier clings to the very shield that he is carrying. You see, if you, uh, it has once been said, if you have been satisfied by God, isn't it true that you will want to cling to him too? If you're not clinging to him, perhaps it is because you have never sought him enough to be truly and deeply satisfied. In this verse, we also see the cooperation between the human and the divine, between mankind and God. You see, God will uphold us 
if we trust in him. And so God is the one who makes it even possible to cling to him in the first place. We see this in the same words uttered by Isaiah in chapter 41 and verse 10 where he says that God will uphold us with his righteous right hand. And then once again in those verses that were read earlier in Philippians chapter 3, Verse 7 says in Philippians chapter 3, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may obtain the resurrection from the dead. You can continue reading and seeing Paul's heart here, but you also see the cooperation between Paul and Christ. Whereas Paul trusts and clings more to Christ, Christ blesses him. And it's interesting because Paul says that even his clinging after him is not because of anything he's done. He's not owed any sort of glory or praise for making the decisions because it is Jesus who has offered him even the opportunity. And we can sing those same praises today. It is God who gives us opportunity to cling and it is God to whom we should be satisfied in. Our entire lives should permeate uh, God should impermeate our entire lives, rather. And when he does, then we will be at peace, knowing and having the conviction that David does in verses 9 through 11. In verses 9 through 11, he shows that God's righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne, that vengeance belongs to him. You see here, it's so fascinating to read these words. It's so profound to look at them because David here is not asking for anything. He has such great trust and confidence in the deliverance of God that he doesn't ask it, he expects it. He doesn't expect it out of any type of disrespect, but he respects it or he expects it because he knows that God has promised it and God is faithful to his promises. In Psalm chapter 89, verse 4, the psalmist states that righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne and love and faithfulness go before him. And then Deuteronomy 32, 35 and Romans 12, 19 state that vengeance belongs to God. And David undoubtedly knew these things as he pens these words here. Read these verses again in verse 9. It says, those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of despair. David returns the reader to the reason for the psalm. He's on the run from his son Absalom. His enemies are present. Really, David's enemies are present in all of his psalms, but they only show up when it comes to their defeat. Did you hear that? David's enemies only show up in the psalms when it comes to their defeat. How great is the victory of God. You see, David knows that his enemies and the enemies of God will surely face defeat, everlasting defeat. In verse 10, he says, They shall be given over to the power of the sword. I love the prophetic sense that you can see in these words here. See, we know that the sword of the Spirit is the word of God, and we, as we read in Ephesians 6.18. And in Revelations 19, verse, Revelation 19, verse 15, we see that Jesus defeats the nation with a sword that comes from his mouth. It's, it's implying that he spoke a word and defeated isn't it amazing and so profound to see here the idea Genesis in the in the book of Genesis God creates with a word in the book of Revelation he defeats and and brings about victory with a word so we see the prophetic sense that is going on here but then he says they shall be a portion for the jackals well this is kind of a weird verse what does it mean well it just means that in their death they will be handed over to these scavengers you see it's just just this profound imagery depicting the worthlessness and wickedness of those who despise and disobey the Lord. Verse 11 is so important for us to understand. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars shall be stopped. David here refers to himself as a king, and this is profound for two reasons. 
One, David as king rejoices in God. He is humbling himself even though he holds the highest position on earth possible. Even as a king, he admits the true lowliness of his position compared to God. He becomes humble and he shows that no matter what we think our status to be, we are all equal when we come before the presence of God. The second reason this is so profound is because David referring to himself as king shows the level of trust that he has in God's plan. You see, Absalom had all but removed David's royalty by forcing him to run for his life. This is demeaning and demoralizing. However, David trusts that God's plan, in God's plan, and he praises God despite the pressures of his position. When trouble befalls us, we also must continue to praise God, knowing that he will deliver us by his will to carry out his plan. There's a story by the philosopher Socrates where he says this young boy comes to him and asks him, great philosopher, teach me, great teacher, teach me how to be successful in life. And so Socrates takes the boy and he says, will you come with me to the ocean seas? And they get to the ocean and he says, will you walk with me into the water? And so they walk into the water and they get about chest high. As they get chest high, Socrates reaches over to the boy, one hand on his head and one hand on his shoulder, and he pushes him down under the water. And the boy begins to struggle for, for life and for air as he, as he is grasping as Socrates holds him under. After some time, Socrates determined that the boy could no longer go on under the water, so he lifts him out out of the water and the boy replies angrily and confused back to the philosopher and says why would you do such a thing what were you doing to me and Socrates says while you were under the water did you think about your mom or your dad your family did you think about food did you think about money or anything like it and the boy says how could I the only thing I could think about was air in life and Socrates said when you desire success as much as you desired air, then you will be successful. While success is not what we are after, our desire for God must be this strong. We must live and breathe and think nothing else but our earnest thirst for the Father. The longing of these verses in Psalm 63 is not the groping of a stranger feeling his way toward God, but it's the eagerness of a friend, almost a lover, to be in touch with the one he holds dear. Jesus expressed this same truth in Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39, where he says the greatest commandment, the greatest thing you can do in your life is to love God with everything that you are and to love your neighbor as yourself. You know, we can only love God as we should when we yearn for Him with our entire nature. There's a quote by a man named Don Williams in the Preacher's Commentary that says, and listen to this because it struck me as I read it this last week. It's so, so convicting. Many Christians go through life with a low sense of spiritual vitality. Our days are largely consumed with secular pursuits. Prayer and Bible reading are one-a-day fast food items. Real life is not life in the spirit, but it's life in the flesh. It's reaching here and there and doing this and that and fitting in a Christian activity largely just to meet our social needs. We may close the night in prayer as a spiritual glaze over our real interest, but there is no manifest heart hunger for God. We must change this. We must be constant in our pursuit for God. Read those words on the screen. We must be constant in our pursuit for God. If we desire to be His people, then our life must be about Him. And it is times in the wilderness where we learn these truths, most often the greatest It's those valley experience or periods in our life where we face hardship and confusion and feeling overwhelmed and incompetent. You see, all these things can be a start of a wonderful revealing of a relationship with God. The wilderness strips us of our defenses and reveals our vulnerability. It quiets us before God and we are now ready to hear Him. 
So how will you respond to the message? Will you fully rely upon God and trust in His provision and protection? Will you earnestly seek after Him and thirst for the Lord? Will you diligently draw closer to God? The other day, Annalena and I had received these journals in the mail that we ordered that will help us to not only grow together, but grow closer to God as a married couple. And these journals will be super useful and helpful as we grow. But my first thought when we received them was not only how excited I was, but it was also how we were going to start these things after things started to slow down a little. We were going to start them after the virus and then after school ends and after we start gathering back and after VBS takes place. We'll start it all then when things begin to slow down. But I realized soon after that that things will rarely slow down. I realize there's no greater time to begin a journey with God than the now. Our days will never be slower or less busy or any calmer. We will never be under any less pressure or face less troubles. Every day of our lives, we are either in a storm, leaving a storm, or getting ready to enter a storm. So the time for God is now and every day. We must learn not to fit God into our days, but to fit our days into God. So today, will you commit to following the Lord? Will you seek after Him? Will you allow Him to penetrate your life? Will you trust in His righteousness? Will you trust in His vengeance? Will you trust in His justice? Will you earnestly thirst for the Father? Song of invitation this morning will be number 934. 934, we'll be singing the first and last verses. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home, earnestly tell. Dismiss us in prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, again, we just uh, we thank you for the many blessings that we have, Lord. Lord, we thank you for for the opportunity to to worship together. Uh, still, may it be different than what we're used to, Lord. We just thank you for that opportunity to continue to worship you, Lord. Lord, we we thank you for the the lesson that we've heard here today and what Todd's brought to us, Lord. Just let us take that and apply it in our lives, Lord, and and let us give us the ability to, to bring it to others, Lord, so we may uh, encourage others to, to follow you, Lord, and, and they may name your name. Lord, just be with the, the, the sick ones, Lord, and Lord, if it, if it be your will, just bring them back their wanted health, Lord. 
Lord, just uh, be with our elders here, Lord, and just guide them and give them the wisdom to, to guide us in the way that, that you would have us to go, Lord. Lord, just uh, be with us as we go throughout the rest of our week, Lord, and Lord, let us just always uh, remember to, to be a light. And when we're faced with difficult situations, Lord, just give us the, the strength and the patience and the guidance to, to just be a light, Lord. Lord, we just thank you for the many blessings that we have each and every day. And Lord, let's, let us never take those for granted. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.